Let's give her another hand. Wasn't that great? What was that, Jack? I know she's <laughs> she's talented. You know, to, today we are talking about joy. If you've looked at the bulletin, we're going to be talking about joy. And if my daughter gets back here with something, I want Pastor Ken and our other pastor, associate pastor, to come up here. I've got something for both of you, for Brandon. Is Pastor Ken in here? Okay. Hope you can bring it right up here. Now, I, I was in the store last week in, in Wichita, and I f saw this, and I thought, I've never seen this, and I had to get it. And it's going to seem a little bit silly, but it made me think of the message this week. On a pack of Oreo cookies, it said joy. No, no, no not yet. <laughs> and I thought, these two guys are going to share about joy this week. And so if they want to share the joy with the rest of you, they can do that. But I've never seen an Oreo cookie, and I thought, you know, maybe somebody really does know what this holiday is all about. And so I just had to buy them for both you guys. So you're going to have to share the joy. <laughs> and now let's all stand and sing about the joy. Joy to the world, the Lord is.
seated. You know, I already mentioned this morning's a lot about joy. You know, you read the New Testament or the Bible about Christmas, joy is one of the words that's mentioned many times. When the announcement of the baby was going to be born, even said that the baby in Elizabeth's womb jumped for joy, leaped for joy, you might say. When the wise men, or not the wise men, the shepherds were out in the field, they were brought new of great joy and told him not to be afraid. So joy is a significant part of our Christmas season. Even Mary, this song we're going to sing, What Child Is This?, is about really her singing about the lullaby and the joy she has with this baby she's going to have, even though she was a teenager. So think about these words as we sing it. Yeah. 
last verse. the Lord. 
for he alone is worthy. 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 Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, you are alone worthy, and we adore you, and that you brought your son so that we could have eternal life, and brought us a babe in a manger to bring us salvation, and for that this morning we praise your name, amen. You may be seated. Because of the the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to being good news, to being to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Everlasting joy will be theirs. And Jesus came to Nazareth, where he was had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened up the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the good gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery to the sight of the, to the blind. To, the, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The first Advent candle reminded us of the hope that our Savior brought, but with that hope comes great joy. The lighting of the second Advent candle reminds us of the joy that Christ brought when he stepped into sinful humanity. For the angels declared to the shepherds, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy will be for all people. And it was good news of great joy that culminated in a heavenly choir of angels in the sky. Glory to God in the highest. And the, when the wise men looked up upon the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The gift of Emmanuel has become, for us, a source of great joy. In Christ, we proclaim the release of captives. We restore sight to those who are spiritually blind, and we preach the gospel to those in bondage. We experience the great and exceeding joy of Christ with us. Advent calls us to remember and meditate on the truth that God is not only with us, but because of this, he has become to us our exceedingly great source of joy. After the wise men saw the star, and it stirred in their hearts exceedingly great joy, they entered into the household, saw the child with Mary and his mother, and fell to the ground and worshipped him. We worship that which gives us the most joy. May this Advent season be a season of great joy that culminates in the worship of our most precious treasure, Jesus Christ.
Good morning. Good morning. And for mission, it's supposed to be the first Sunday of the month, which was last Sunday, but we had two mission reports, so we'll have our minute for missions this week. Our focus this month for our ministry is on Randall and Katie Harms and Seth Harms. Randall and Katie work with international students at WSU in Wichita. They had a welcome party at the beginning of the school year to form new relationships. They had their largest turnout for their event called The Great Giveaway with 160 students. Their team has a monthly international women's connection where the students can learn about American culture and hear a short gospel message. We heard from Seth Harms last month. He was here during our Harvest Missions Conference. He's scheduled to return to East Timor, leaving on the 1st of January. So let's pray for our missionaries this morning. Father, thank you for the ministries of Randall and Katie and Seth. Thank you, Lord, for their willingness to follow your leading, to work with people of, from another culture. As Randall and Katie minister to students, Lord, from a variety of cultures and countries, just pray, Lord, that you will give them wisdom, know the best approach. Soften the hearts of the students, Lord, to the message of the gospel. Also pray for Seth as he plans to return in a couple of weeks to East Timor. Help him to endure the long, grueling flight back. Grant his team wisdom as they will teach English classes and have children's clubs. I pray that there will be a renewed interest <coughs> among the children to attend. And so we take Randall and Katie and Seth and we put them into your hands during this Christmas season. Lord, bless them richly and provide their needs in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, a couple of announcements. Uh, you notice that the uh, envelopes are out in the pews. This is traditionally our second Sunday of the month when we have our offering for Love Mead. So when the ushers come, if you want to give towards Love Mead, let me just reiterate, Love Mead means we love our community, right? And so there's folks in the community, especially this time of year, have needs. And so what you contribute into the envelopes, uh, we're able to distribute in the community. It does not go to pay any of the bills at the church. If you just put your offering into the the bags the regular way it will go into the general fund so that's uh one announcement uh community life meets at five o'clock at the high school any announcements regarding community life are we good Amen. all right five o'clock what was that oh okay five o'clock um next uh next sunday there's a dinner right after church so I invite you all to stay for that it's a fundraiser for the Haynes boys, who are going to go to Ecuador on the trip, so looking forward to that next week. And then next Sunday night, <coughs> we have the Christmas concert, so we'll take note of all those, uh, of those events. All right, we'll call the ushers forward then at this time. Let me just give a quick update on Tristan Cook. <coughs> As you know, he broke his femur uh, in an accident uh, carrying furniture. Uh, there was a little discoloration we noticed on the x-rays when they went to check out his break right where the leg was broken there was a little discoloration so they're trying to figure out what in the world's going on why this child has what appears to be a previous injury or something there's something going on at that spot so they're really waiting for some answers before they know which way to pursue as far as uh, fixing them back up so that's what we're waiting on so i'm just going to give an update so continue to pray for the cook family uh they've done a lot of scans and tests and done different things and this week i guess we're going to find out what's going on and just pray for good answers, clarity, wisdom. And then as the surgeon gets busy and uh, begins to prepare uh, him for surgery on that leg, that uh, things will just uh, go and he'll be back on his feet in no time. So let's pray together. Father, we are indeed grateful that we have opportunity to give. And as we give today, Lord, we can give to our community through Love Me, but we can also give to our general fund. So we appreciate the opportunity, Lord. Remind us again that we're only ma managers and stewards. We are not owners. This world is owned by you and all and everything in it. And so, Father, help us to be reminded again that we are stewards and managers. So show us what you want us to do. Thank you for the gifts that will be given this morning. Lift up our community event this afternoon. And the, as the community gathers for another time of fellowship, we just pray, Lord, for your blessing there. Relationships could be built. There's a lot of folks in this community that have no pastor. They have no church. And they just they, they don't really ascribe to... Uh, to a religion or anything like that. And so, Father, we just pray that we continue to point those people out to us that we could really minister. Thank you for our love, Mead, and the deacons when they, uh, they distribute these funds to those that have a need outside of our church in our community. 
that uh, you just would point out the ones that are the ones that we need to help. And so we thank you, Father, for this opportunity. Thank you for Treston, too, and just heal his leg, Lord. And we do know they're waiting on some test results. You're in charge of that, Lord. So we just pray that you would uh, just bring so much glory to your name through it. But we do pray, Lord, for uh, positive results going forward so that the answers can be clear, so that, that the pathway can be established for surgery and then uh, bring Treston back on his feet again, Lord. So just give him courage and strength to walk this road. <coughs> give him patience. Uh, sometimes these healings take a while, Lord. And uh, so, again, we don't question your ability, Lord. We know you have all power in the world. To heal him is nothing to you. You just would want to say the word and it'd be done. You can do that, Lord. We don't question that. We don't know what your will is yet. So until we know your will, clearly, Lord, we'll continue to lift him up to you. And uh, we just pray for his family and safety for those many people that are traveling. So, again, Lord, we thank you for all our opportunities we have, our loved ones at Christmas that are uh, going to travel soon. We lift up our college students and our our students who are going to be finishing school in this semester and then taking a two-week break or so. So we thank you, Lord, for the season that we're in and the joy that is produced this time of year. May it generate from us this morning. We have prayed these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh. 
don't worry, boy. You'll be plenty warm. I've got you wrapped up in your mother's old blanket. <laughs> Some happened we've had, haven't it, huh? A 90 mile walk. And for what? So you could be born in a stable. Now, if we were home in Nazareth, I could build you a fine crib. But here, no crib. I have to put you to sleep in the hay. I only wish I knew what I was doing. Now, your mother, she knows. She was certain. After the angel talked to her, you know, I was visited by an angel too. Only mine was more, more in a dream, you know. And, but I, I wrote it all down so I, could, so I could remember it. It goes like this. Joseph, son of David, do not fear for Mary to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save the people from their sins. I don't know how that's going to be done, but I'm through doubting. I just, I know that you will be, no, you are the Messiah. And I have been chosen to be the Papa to Messiah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Your mother will have my hide if I don't get you back in there pretty quick. But I just wanted to show you this, this beautiful star, this brand new star here that shows. I just wanted you to see it and tell you how happy you've made me. No, it's, it's, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's what did the shepherds say um, that the angel told them? He said, uh, I bring you good tidings of great joy. That's it. Joy. Yes, that's it. Joy. You have given me my brand new baby boy. You have given me joy. Such joy. Yeah. All right, so we'll dismiss for junior church. If you are age three through the first grade, today you're going to follow Miss Grace. Don't follow Miss Emily, you follow Miss Grace. <coughs> age three through first grade. Um, each week in the Advent, you're going <coughs> to... Be introduced to another character. Last week we had quite the character, Isaiah. Uh, this week you saw Joseph. Next week we'll have Mary and then the shepherds. And if you come back on Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock for our service, we're going to put it all together. With music, the whole drama will unfold. And uh, so at 5 o'clock, so I invite you all to that. Uh, I learned, uh, we went to the Ball Brothers concert last night. And so, oh, it was awesome. Oh, that was amazing. Now, I'll tell you something that was not amazing. Do not, okay, do not take, like I, I had a coughing fit late in the afternoon, and, and Lynn and Lori were going to pick us up. We were going to go with them. They were going to pick us up at 3.45. So at 3.30, I, I'd had this coughing fit for about 30 minutes. So I went to the refrigerator, took some cough medicine. Do not take NyQuil <laughs> late in the afternoon. <laughs> We did hardly make it to garden, and I was starting to doze off. And by the time we got to Lake, and I was totally and completely doze. I mean, I, I, my whole body went numb. I'm not, I'm not that, that. Take that stuff at night before you go to bed. I just purely didn't look. So I'm passing my experiences on to you. I do certainly have more joy today than I did yesterday. <laughs> My wife thought first I was being rude. I was going to sleep in the car. I said, I'm not feeling good. Something's wrong. I'm not feeling right. I'm, I'm way off. And I think she said the first half of the concert, she wondered if I even thought that I was there at the concert the first half. Wow. Anyway, 
do not take NyQuil. This is severe. NyQuil severe, it says on the bottle. If I'd have just read it, I would have never taken it at 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> Whew. Anyway, I'm here. We met. And here, hey, bless the Lord, praise him. I was not driving. That right there would have been. So the Lord preserved me. He said he would preserve our coming and our going, right? And he sure did. Okay, so last week uh, we looked at hope, uh, which is the opposite of despair, right? Christians have every reason to be hopeful. Even in a, in a very dark world, we have every reason to be filled with hope. And uh, should be no reason at all for us to be people of despair. Even, even if we suffer the death of a loved one, right? Paul writes, we sorrow, but we do not sorrow like those who have no hope. Why? Because we have hope. That's the beautiful part. Today we want to focus on joy. Joy. God with us, Emmanuel. Today we look at the joy of Christmas. If you have your Bibles, let's start reading in Luke chapter 2, verse 8. We'll read down to verse 15 for now. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. <coughs> and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Great here means to stay or remain in a constant state of joy. Doesn't, it's not, you're, not, you're not joy, and then it goes away. And then you have joy again, and then it goes away. No, no, this word great joy is the word that means to stay or to remain in continuing joy. So the news, the news from the angel was, do not be afraid. I have news for you. There is great joy to all people. That, that is good news, isn't it? No one's left out, okay? Doesn't matter what side of the street you're born on. Doesn't matter which country. Doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, the color of your skin. Doesn't matter, right? Because this joy is for all people. And then here comes the good news. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass that as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. It would have been a little bit odd if they didn't go. So that's why he said it was even that they went to Bethlehem. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. Let's pray. Father, we are indeed grateful that you have made this thing known. That event that happened in that sleeping town of Bethlehem, uh, a man, a woman, husband and wife who, who were having a baby that night, and there was, there was no room for them. And so they went into the stable below the house where the animals were kept. Nice warm place for them to have this baby. No one would have known that something extraordinary had happened if you hadn't made it known. So we're grateful, Lord, that you made it known to us. Of course, now that we know, we have a responsibility to receive that news and to do something with it. And that will be our intent this morning, Lord. We want that joy, that great continuing, never-ending joy. We want the joy that, 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 that heaven was filled with and, and the joy spilled down to the earth. That joy. That one is the one we want, Lord. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Can you picture the joy explosion in heaven? Whoa! Somebody was rejoicing in heaven, and that thing spilled over and come down to the earth. What is there about the birth of this baby boy that had heaven rejoicing to this extent? Just think about that. Okay? Heaven is rejoicing at this particular birth of this child in Bethlehem. So the shepherds, they, they want to go over and check it out. They realize very quickly, oh boy, there's a party in heaven. And it spills out of heaven to the earth. we got to go check this thing out because this is completely unusual. 
And I just imagine the, the, the first, the fright or the fear. I mean, if you're out watching flock at night and you had even one angel appear to you, I think you would be filled with fear. But that angel said, hey, don't be afraid, right? It's almost like uh, in the dark alley, you meet someone and you're not sure who it is. It all, you, you just get, you know, your hair stands up. You get this feeling something's not right. And a friendly voice says, hey, I'm just going home from work. Don't mind me. I do that once in a while. I have to come back for something at night here in the church. This, you ever been in this place at night? No one else here is a creaky place. <laughs> Woo! These tall ceilings creak pretty good. And I saw a car outside. I know somebody's here. So I come in, I make a lot of noise. I want to be sure somebody else who's here knows that I'm coming in the door. I don't want to startle them. I did that one morning. I was bright and early. I came in early for something. It was like 6.30. Marchand's car was here. Lights are on her office. Nobody's here. Where is she? I thought she must be in the restroom. So I went and knocked on the restroom door. Hey, Marchand, it's pastor. I'll let you know I'm here. I don't want her coming out of the room and she turns a corner thinking she's by herself in this place and someone else is here, right? So you can just picture that interruption at night. The, the shepherds are doing their thing and this angel just appears. So the shepherds, they go to Bethlehem and check it out. And sure enough, the angel was right. Wow, there's a happy couple full of joy at the birth of their baby. Matthew records it this way. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we'll start reading at verse number, let's go to 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. That means this is not hearsay. That means the birth of Jesus Christ is not based on anything other than facts. Let me tell you how it went, Matthew says. The birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. Okay, that's what he's saying. When his mother Mary, this is part of the Christmas story. When his mother Mary was espoused, or we have the term engagement, they, he was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, minded to put her away privately. Joseph and Mary's parents had entered into a contract. Okay, Mary had been checked over, her family, her doctors... Everyone confirmed Mary is a virgin. Joseph pays the dowry, the price of the bride, to Mary's parents. He enters into a contract. And then he hears, Joseph hears that Mary is pregnant. Boy, I tell you what, that's a rough way to start. And so, he was a just man, and I, I'm glad for that. Mary had a fiance, a husband-to-be who was a just man, and he was minded to not make her a public example. No, they even got to post everything on Facebook saying, this, look at what Mary's done. Aren't you tired of that? People are just airing out all that dirty laundry. He was a just man, and he was not willing to make her a public example. Matter of fact, her life could be in danger too, because she had what deemed to be had been unfaithful. The contract had been broken. Mary's parents are now liable for something here because they had received the price of the bride. Right? And they had a, a, assured this young man, Joseph, that their daughter was pure and that she was a virgin. And so he was minded to put her away privately, get out of the contract privately. Just make a deal again with her parents, away from the public, to protect her life. While he thought on these things, okay, he's mulling over what his options are. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so Joseph is assured by this angel that there's nothing wrong. Everything is just the way it's supposed to be. Mary has been chosen by God to be the... The, the one who's going to bring the Messiah to earth. Okay, so the angel has, is explaining to him what's happening. And then he does uh, what a lot of people do today. They have a gender reveal before the baby's born. She's going to have a son. Okay, so this gender reveal thing, millennials, is not new. No, 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 no. You're not the first ones to think of it. Right? 
Everyone now knows Mary, when she has a baby, she is having a boy. And another thing, Joseph is not going to be, or Mary, is not going to be in charge of picking the name. And imagine that, right? You have a baby, you want to pick the child's name. You shall call his name Jesus. Who calls him Jesus? Jesus' father is calling him Jesus. Who is Jesus' father? God, right? Don't forget that. God said, this is my son. I want him to be known as Jesus. In Hebrew, it would be Yeshua, Jesus. So, and the word Jesus means for God saves. So that's why he, he gives the interpretation there of the name. For he shall save his people from their sins. The angel identifies to Joseph that what's going on. He explains it to him how Mary and the child that she's carrying is, is Jesus. And he's the redeemer of the world. And Joseph has explained, it's time. You know all those prophecies you've read about? This is it, Joseph. This is it. All right. 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with, with us. Joseph then... Being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. I think that he would have been pretty excited. As the prophet said, he goes, hold on now. I think that was Isaiah. So I can just picture him running through the Isaiah scroll. Yeah, right here. Hold it, hold it now. Okay, hold it now. I get that part. Isaiah said a virgin was going to be have a baby. That's Mary. I, I see it now. And she's going to have a child, yes, but I'm going to call him Jesus. But the prophet said he would be called Emmanuel. And Joseph, hold it, wait a minute. Is that the same thing? Yeah. Emmanuel is a description of God coming down to us. Jesus is God coming down to us. Another description of God coming down to us is, why is he coming down to us? God wants to save us, right? Jesus. God saves. That's Jesus' name. So, here's Joseph. Understands what's going on. Finds the passage in the scripture. Does exactly like the angel said. And continue to follow through with the contract that he had made with Mary's parents and have the wedding. What was important was, verse 25, he knew her not. In other words, he never consummated the marriage, never had any sexual relations with her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. Keep the word firstborn in your mind and come back next Sunday. We want to look at the idea of Jesus being the firstborn. We do think. As a matter of fact, I'm the only one in this room who knows that at this point because I know what I'm preaching on next Sunday. <laughs> he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. All right, back to Luke chapter 2. Joseph understands he's going to become a father, like a stepfather, so to speak, for a baby boy. And this baby boy is going to be none other than God himself. I, I, I don't know how you process that. At first, he had to process the news that he was hearing that Mary was going to have a baby. Now he has to process the rest of this. But I think great joy would have overcome Joseph as he's becoming a father. Me. Chosen by God. Just like Mary was chosen by God. We are the couple. God is choosing to use. It's no wonder there was such joy in heaven over the birth of this child. God is finally coming down to us and he is declaring that his purpose for coming down is to save us. Incredible. It's no wonder heaven was rejoicing. I can just imagine, this is, this, is, this is my puny little brain. As some of you know who've been here any length of time, my brain kind of thinks in pictures. I can picture God who is sick and tired of animal sacrifices. 
just tired of it. Because the scripture says that they can never, with those sacrifices, take away sin. He knew it was not enough. But he was allowing it, he was putting up with it until the right time in history. I can almost picture God, his joy is just exuberant, finally. So long overdue. And so there's a gathering of the angels. What's got God so exuberantly joyous? And they're told the news. And they hear the angel announcing to the shepherds. And they come down and they say, hey, you have no idea. Now, do you know that the angel that came down to talk to the shepherds, that his name was Lo? It says, Lo, the angel of the Lord. So you always thought Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer were the only angels with names? And well, not only that. Over here in Luke chapter 2, notice what it says. That the, they were singing... Saying, glory to God in the highest. They were in the highest tenor. And then here comes the bass section, low. What? They were singing glory to God. I'm reading it in the Bible. They were singing glory to God in the highest. And low. No, actually, he was low because he had to come down from on high. Okay. I'm just making sure you guys are I was just making sure you guys didn't take some kind of NyQuil this morning before you came to church. All right, where are we at? The explosion of joy from the angelic choir. Joy and wonder at what the shepherds said they saw when they came to Bethlehem. Everyone's filled with joy. Everyone is filled with joy. Look what happens to Mary. Verse 19. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Think about that. God has chosen us. God is going to save because our son is going to be called Jesus. God saves. The shepherds told their story to Mary and Joseph, what they had experienced from what the angel's message was. Everyone was filled with joy. See, because we need to get the Christmas message back into our culture because the message of Christmas that we have in our culture is robbing people of their joy. It's completely taking the joy of Christmas away. Okay. So Mary was keeping all these things in front of them in her heart. Like I said, that's next week's topic. So come back next week. What's Joseph doing? Okay, let's go to the next verse, verse 22. Actually, let's just go to verse, uh, verse 20. The angels says, The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished, some significant event is going to go on eight days after the birth of Jesus. Okay, so on the eighth day, those days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child. I will not explain circumcision. Parents, tell your children what that is. You can explain it yourself to them. His name was called Jesus, which was so named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Notice, he had that name before he was conceived. Right? I've, I've said this many times. You guys know this. And I want you to hear it again. Jesus did not start at Bethlehem, right? Yeah. Right. He just took a different form. He was always with God the Father. He always was loved by the Father. He always was the Son of God. At the right time in history, he allowed the Holy Spirit, who is energizing at creation, to once again energize over the Son of God, and Christ became an embryo implanted in Mary's womb. She could become pregnant without having known a man. Okay, so eight days go by. And so let's look at what happens on the eighth day. Okay, eight days are accomplished for the circumcising of the child. His name was called Jesus, which was so named by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Some of Joseph's joy is surrounding this experience on the eighth day. Okay, all Jewish men knew the significance of this event. The day when one son, especially, especially, here that comes word, the word again, the firstborn son. The first child to open the womb, in this case, the firstborn male, 
to open Mary's womb. Significant day. The day when one son, especially the firstborn, was officially included in the covenant relationship with God. We find all about, read all about this in, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 9 to 13. God enters into a covenant with Abraham. And God's covenant with Abraham was, Abraham, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I've chosen you, Abraham, to become a father of many nations. But what did I do? Nothing. I just chose you. Well, my wife can't have children. Don't worry. That's also my problem. He had to understand that without a wife who could have a child, that God was going to make of him many nations. He was going to be the father of many nations. How do I know it's going to be true? God enters into a covenant with Abraham and makes promises to Abraham that are completely based on the character of God. Because Abraham can't do anything about it. Him and his wife, they're not going to have a child. Right? Mary, without a husband, she's never going to get pregnant. As a virgin, it's not going to happen. But God can. God and Abraham enter into a covenant. And the sign of that covenant, I want you to have a sign on you, Abraham. Cutting of the foreskin made a circumcision. And every time Abraham saw the sign, he was reminded that he was in a covenant relationship with God. All Jewish men, all Jewish men from that point on. This ancient Jewish tradition is known as Brit Milah, or the covenant of circumcision. Dates all the way back to Abraham and the covenant that Abraham and God entered into with God concerning a promise of him becoming a father of many nations. This is the sign, circumcision. I don't have theological background to emphatically say for certain, but I think today the sign of you and I being in a covenant with God is water baptism. I think the water baptism is a nice way to show the sign. I always remember the day I went into water and the preacher baptized me upon the fact that I had already entered into a covenant with God. Okay, so the Jewish men carried the sign around. A sign that they were being set apart for God. The God who had created the world in six days, then he rested on the seventh day. Now, do you remember that, right? There was a wedding on the sixth day. Adam and Eve got married. They probably honeymooned on day seven when God rested. And Monday, they had to leave the honeymoon, and they had to show up for work the eighth day, right? God worked six days, rested the seventh, and then on the eighth day, new life is coming forth. And so God chose the eighth day from the birth of a male child to enter into this sign, to partake of the fact, and the joy in Joseph to understand that his firstborn child was entered into the covenant with God. Think of the significance of it. Was Jesus in a covenant relationship with God? Yeah, of course he was. He'd always had that. Now he carries around the physical sign that he's in that covenant relationship. Joseph had the mark. I'm sure Joseph's father before him had the mark. And his father before him. And now Jesus also bears that mark. He would literally be able to trace his lineage, as far as the covenant is concerned, back to Abraham. People say, what's the big deal for that? Well, the Jews thought it was a huge deal. Remember how they kept going after Jesus all the time? They they were disputing with Jesus about who he was. Remember that? John chapter 8, verse 41. John in chapter 8 has this discussion with the Pharisees. You know? He said, you are of your father the devil. They say, no, God's our father. They go, listen... How do you know? Well, we have Abraham as our father, earthly, and then, therefore, we're children of God. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, look, if you really were the children of Abraham, you would have the same faith of Abraham. Abraham believed in me. So the Pharisees said, who is your dad? And Jesus said, God. They said, no way. Jesus said, yeah, way. You guys are on it. Yahweh. All right. All right, I just couldn't let that one go. 
able to trace his lineage covenant right back to Abraham. They could not get past the fact that his mother had been pregnant before the wedding. And they bring that up in John 8, 41. But at least we're not born from fornications. Boy, that's a slap on Jesus, isn't it? They were buying into the story, perpetrating it in the community that Jesus' parents, that his mother had been pregnant before they were married. Yeah, she was. Right now we know why and we know the truth of it. They too knew the truth of it. They just refused to believe it. They were kind of like modern day scientists. They say that doesn't happen. Okay, so on the eighth day, they go to the temple and they are doing this procedure with Jesus, circumcision. And as Joseph is holding his son during the procedure, and I have in brackets in my notes, this was, I don't know, just a thought I had, the first time Jesus bled. His father was holding him in his hands and they're performing the rite of circumcision on him. And the joy that would have been in Joseph's heart knowing that his son was entering into this covenant with God, into that relationship. And then, of course, 33 years later, Jesus made another covenant with God. At this time, he bled and he died on the cross at Calvary. Remember that story? It's about the cross, folks. You cannot have any significance for Easter unless you have Christmas, and you can't have Christmas without Easter. When the angel said to the shepherds, here's your sign, right? You're going to find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. Do you know what the definition of swaddling clothes is? It's called grave clothes. Why is a baby wrapped in grave clothes? Because he came to die, right? John points him out as the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That'd be a sure sign, right? You go into, you're expecting the baby to be in a receiving blanket. Something that resembles a new birth. No, they saw something that resembled death. Wow. 33 years later, he made his covenant with God as he bled and died upon the cross at Golgotha. This time he cried to his heavenly father as he said, it is finished. Jesus saves. God is saving his people. Imagine the joy of the Father in heaven. And finally, there's the Father, finally could say, I have received the payment for sin that was so long overdue. The, the, the heart of God would have just been rejoicing at Calvary. People say, how can a father rejoice over the death of his son? Because he knew finally, right? Finally. The payment had been fully made. And when Jesus cried, it is finished. Oh, the joy would have just been exuberant in heaven. Same as it was on Christ's birth. I think that's what Luke is picking up on when he talks in Luke 15, verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents. What kind of party goes on in heaven when a sinner repents and comes to faith in Christ? That's because of Christmas, right? It's no wonder the angels brought such news of great joy. Now, who's rejoicing in heaven? If you're like me, you're picturing God is rejoicing. Why? A sinner has been saved. That's why he has Christmas, right? God saves. You shall call his name Jesus. God saves. I can see the Father rejoicing. Now watch. Verse 10, Luke 15. Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Oh, man. The angels get word of a sinner repenting, and then they break out rejoicing. Incredible. It's incredible if you can be a Christian, a sinner who has been saved from his sins, and you cannot be a person filled with joy. You are, you are an incredible, you are at an incredible disadvantage in your Christian life. There's no reason for it. You got your mind on the wrong thing, brothers and sisters, if you can't have joy as a believer. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Hebrews 12, verse 2. The Bible says that Jesus was looking at the cross. And, and then the writer says, the joy that's set before him. 
Jesus is being led by the Roman soldiers to be crucified on the cross. And this writer has the audacity to say, oh, the joy that filled Jesus' heart because of the cross. He's right. He's right. The joy of the cross. Why? Because he could finally fulfill the Father's will. That gave Christ great joy. There's your answer. What's going to bring you joy in your life is you knowing that you can be part of fulfilling the Father's will. Second thing was, Jesus was keeping promises. Prophecies were being fulfilled that were written about him. Does that bring you joy? That, that, that God could use us to lead someone to faith in Christ and we can start a party in heaven with God and the angels rejoicing over one sinner. We could be part of that. Isn't, doesn't that give you joy? The redemption of the lost. Does that really fill us with joy to think that we could be used of God to help bring people to faith in Christ? The prospect of his restoration to glory. He looked beyond the cross. Beyond the cross. He was just looking at the cross. He went past it to the resurrection. To when he would be back in his father's house. Seated at the right hand of God. And then his eternal union with us in love. To forever be with his people whom he loved. I can just imagine. God must be. And again my mind thinks in pictures. How tired is God by now to have so many Christians still on the earth fighting against sin, knowing that he wants all of us to be in his presence, never to be separated from him again. Oh, the joy that awaits Jesus to know that one day we will all be together, never to be separated again. Home improvement, final edition. Right? Does that give you joy? James says in James chapter 1 verse 2, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials and temptations. You and I are to count it as joy when we encounter. Diverse meaning many different kinds of trials and temptations. Okay, so here comes a trial in my life. Do not file it in F in your filing cabinet for failure. Don't do it. Don't file it under L for lost. Don't file it under T for trouble. You and I are told to file it under J for joy. File it in the file called joy. We are to consider it like Jesus did. Joy. When we fall into diverse trials and temptations. Jesus said in John 16, verse 22, that nobody can take away your joy. Are you, are you aware of that? Nobody can take away your joy. Nobody. Because your joy is not found in circumstances. The joy is found in Christ himself. Verse 24, he says that your joy may be full. Christ said, I've come. That your joy may be full. And when we ask for things in prayer. If, you, if, you, if you're lacking in joy, go to pray. Pray to God more. Look at that. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask. Right? And you shall receive. You know what he says there? That your joy may be full. He don't want us running around and half filled with joy. He didn't want Christians to be all gloom and doom and Oh, the world is lost. All hope is lost. It's all over but the singing, right? No, it's not that way. All right, we'll conclude. Do 20, 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Oh, look at that. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. What joy will be in heaven on that great resurrection morning when the dead in Christ 
We will rise from the graves and we will be presented faultless before the throne. And the exceeding joy that heaven will abound with at that point. You and I should not picture our diverse different trials and temptations with sadness and despair. We ought to consider it a joy because we know how it's going to end. Oh, the joy of Christmas. I pray that it would return to your heart. Let's pray. Father, wow, we're indeed grateful that Heaven is rejoicing over the birth of the Messiah. Heaven is rejoicing over the salvation of a sinner. Heaven is rejoicing when we're presented before the throne. We haven't yet found a time when heaven is not rejoicing. And we're part of the heavenly kingdom. Oh, Father, we know joy, just the same as negativity, are contagious. We want to spend time in your presence that your joy will, 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 will captivate us and it will overflow to us and it will spill out of us and it would spill onto everyone we come to so that once again the true joy to the world may be the message that the Lord is come. Let earth receive the King. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I got it.